take it away, Amy. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> film is just kind of mind-blowing really. A lot is introduced in, in this one, people, places. Our director has clearly brought his own vision. It was as, as if having carte blanche to, to let your dreams go loose. Our main thing for Gary Oldman's character was he had to look like he'd been in Azkaban. His eyes very deep set. Haunted, teeth rotting. Oh, you're going to kill me, Harry. We designed these tattoos. His whole body was absolutely covered in tattoos all down his arms. And it's a very, very scary image when you first see that. His description in the book is he has this sort of like long, kind of greasy hair and he's got a face like a corpse when you first see him. We tried a good few looks with him before we ended up with the look we had. Hi! And we tried very, very short hair. We're over the 12 years. I'd gone grey. We tried it bearded, not bearded. It, it was thoroughly researched. Gary's amazing. You know, you just put it all on and he, the character just came. I look like I, I've escaped from prison, don't you, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> this heart is where you truly live. This heart here! Oh. 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 This is meant to be Professor Lupin. He's turned into a werewolf. So we did the transformation sequence with prosthetic makeup effects on David Thewlis. It was hard to do without the cliche teeth coming down. And so we concentrated on the eyes and the actual skin. Alfonso wanted him with two big scars down his face so that that could follow on to the werewolf. So you could get the connection between the two of them. I've never actually done anything with that scale of prosthetics before. To watch yourself transform over the space of six hours is just remarkably fascinating. And watch yourself become unrecognizable was uh, exciting. Action! Nails! You go as far as you can using the actor because you want the performance. But there's a point where you're gonna kill your actor. So obviously you then mutate away from the human and go into the virtual. When we actually talked about the transformations, you know, we had to consider how Lupin was going to transform into the werewolf. Most of it was achieved inside the computer with his head turning into the werewolf. That in itself is, is just exciting, just because of the energy of the, of the creature just kind of transforming through. And then the other main one was Peter Pettigrew. <laughs> Tim Spall gave Peter Pettigrew. Pettigrew is the most rat-like character you can imagine. This was the animatronic rat. It was making the connection between, you know, Peter Pettigrew being the rat and that he to make him look as rat-like as we could. The wig, we we tried to get the texture of the rat, the colour, balding pieces, scaly skin. And we had the teeth made, little pair of teeth. We wanted him, because he used his hands a lot, and we had little um, nails made to stick on, so they were like little claws. The wonderful thing is, is that as soon as you start putting the character on, any doubts you had about the way you were going to play it, um, you know, uh, they come together. I'm a good friend, a good pet. You won't let them give me to the Dementors, will you? I was your rat! When we were first approached about doing the first Harry Potter, they said, it's just some children. And actually, <laughs> it's turned into a great deal more than just some children. Come on, move it along, move it along. Yeah, man. There's a creature that the Dementors, they aren't so much in the cave that if they open a door, maybe the, 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 their fingers can fall apart. But in the other hand, they just need to inhale and they take away your soul. So we wanted to do something that was abstract and metaphysical. Alfonso had an idea that one of the ways to distinguish them, them was through their movement. Dementors don't walk, they float. And so if they float, I guess it was a, you know, a fairly natural step to, to say, OK, well, what would happen to the robes? Well, how would they move most effectively? 
I was a little hesitant about CG, so I wanted to do everything old school. I wanted to do mirror tricks and I wanted to do puppets. We just did the, the basics of some flying puppets with wind and, and what effect that had. And it just wasn't working at all. It wasn't anything like Alfonso was thinking. Alfonso had this idea of putting, putting this thing in the water and seeing how it moved. There's a great puppeteer in San Francisco called Basil Twist. So he came here to London. Uh, what he does is he does puppeteer underwater, and we shot a couple of tests with the mentor floating, slow motion, and running the, the camera backwards. And it was really beautiful. The only problem was it was not practical. We would never be able to do all of that animation within something like a tank. For what we wanted to achieve, we just, it was just way too difficult to do. We realized at the time that we'd have much more control over what these things look like, how they behaved, how they performed, if you put them in a CGI environment. Pretty much anything we looked at, any films that may have something similar, really didn't kind of come close. So it was really more a matter of trial and error and imagination. And one of the directions we got from Alfonso was that these guys are not in a hurry. They've got lots of time. There's no sense of urgency. So the character and the cloth had to emote that sort of feeling. So we went through quite a, a lot of iterations to give that sort of performance from the character and from the cloth. ILM, through many, many tests, came up with a fabric look. It was phenomenal. Hagrid. Exactly what is that? That run is a hippogriff. A hippogriff, as described in the book, is a combination of several creatures. And when you send off your, your artist to go and do conceptual designs, Alfonso gave them a guideline of what he was looking for, plus they had the description from the book. That was actually a very interesting process to see how the conceptual artists worked. Uh, I thought it was easier. And then I started going to the office of the designers, and I would see all these skeletons. They had skeletons of birds and skeletons of horses and they were having meetings with uh, physiologists and, 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 and uh, veterinarians and, and says, what is that for? He says, well, I mean, if it was just a picture you draw, you can do whatever you want. The problem is that this is going to be a 3D character that is going to be moving. So we have to start from the bones. We did motion tests. One of the first things we did was we went to the computer and said, okay, if it's a horse back in and a bird front legs, how does it move and how does it run and how does it fly? I think it was very clear from the beginning that Alfonso had a very, a very definite vision about how he wanted Buckbeak to be as a character and, and our challenge was to interpret that. So we do a lot of tests before we actually start really working on the movie about what kind of animal is it? You know, is he excitable? Is he sad? Is he, you know, how do you show that in a shot? I remember the very early animations and it was like a puppy. Just jumping, you know, very light and poppy and playful. This is no, I mean, this is, this is like a baby. Buckbeak is, is a grown up and also is a sloppy. I think he was once described as a sloppy teenager. And so we kind of did a lot of development in the early days to try and combine those characteristics. Uh, it was pretty tricky. The amazing thing is it was really a long process of defining. Pretty much it was the same show that we'll redo over and over, each time with a little different character. And there was a point in which they nailed it. Every hippogriff scene was storyboarded because the cost of each shot is not inconsiderable. Once the previs was finalized, then we shot those scenes. Very good. When Dan has to interact with the hippogriff, um, we actually have props that can give him something to interact with. So we, for that scene, we actually had a beak on a stick that he could touch and caress that we would then replace with the CG hippogriff. Ready and action. The complication of the flight was how to get Harry to interact and look like he was really riding the, the creature. And the way we went about that was we developed a motion rig that he would ride which would actually have the animation driving it, so that his actions would also match the actions of the animation. And then we have the moments where he's flying over the castle, which is this huge scale model that was built and photographed at a studio. So there's all these different pieces, and part of our job is obviously to put them together in a way that makes it all believable. Then it started becoming like an automatic thing. It was about suggesting fun stuff that he could be doing. No, 
have to let him make the first move. If you watch carefully in the paddock scene, yeah, yeah, we have an animated hippogriff poop shot. I think that we can lay claim to it being the first time that a CG animal has actually done that on screen. Yeah, yeah, nearly there, nearly there, nearly there. This particular buck beak is our number three buck beak, and he was designed to be in the backgrounds of shots where he's the reference for all the CG work because, of course, if it's a CG creature, it's not there, and the kids have nothing to perform against, and if you can put something like this there, then the kids know exactly what they're dealing with and can react to it. Ah, uh, the thing. He was difficult because every material we used we had to be sure could be matched by the CG guys. The manufacturing period was four and a half months of solid work. The hippogriff skin is a tailored lycra, but over that is a feather skin. Each feather has been individually artworked by a team of people over months. And of course, everything we build is a prototype, so we don't know when we start exactly how we're going to build it. We have to try mocking things up, see how it works, hoping we reach the end of the road before it's time to shoot it. If a creature has to perform on location, you've got to figure out how you get him there, how he's going to behave within that environment. It's a nightmare because you, it's not something you can service. You can't run off to the nearest shop and buy a new part. It's incredibly labour-intensive, incredibly specialised work to make it move correctly. Buckbeat was a phenomenal piece of design. I don't know how the hell those guys do it. I mean, it's got like 5,000 electric motors in it and making it do. I mean, at times, you'd look at it and it'd be moving its head and blinking you think, just any moment it's going to stand up and fly off. It's meant to be the most haunted building in Britain. Did I mention that? <laughs> Twice. The Shrieking Shack is on a mountainside outside Hogwarts and is racked by the wind and the blizzard and, uh, and it moves. Inside the Shrieking Shack, things like doorways and windows were actually triangulating. So it became quite an interesting construction um, for us as well as the construction department to try and make all these things come alive. So we had to build a, a frame that would move backwards and forwards that we could then build the set inside and this of course had to be completely safe because the actors were uh, and the crew were in it um, throughout the scene Expelliarmus! welcome to the night bus emergency transport for a stranded witch or wizard the night bus was particularly interesting for us to actually achieve a bus of such height we cut a bus in half, lifted it, and then constructed the middle section. It was found that a normal London bus was going to be too slow for the sequence, so we obviously had to make a bus that could produce probably twice the speed. The other thing is that every move that we made, it was, it was uh, like a circus moving because it was this whole entourage driving all around London. Every time it goes around a corner and it rocks one way and then it rocks back the other, they wanted everything in the bus to, to be rocking, including the, the actors inside. Three, two, one, go! We built an interior that was mounted on top of a hydraulically controlled motion base. This allows us to move the bus from side to side under controlled conditions. It just allows the unit to shoot inside and get the shots that you wouldn't be able to get out on the streets. Pedicure at two. Hurry up! I wanted Hogwarts and Scotland, where we shot, to have like a, a really a predominant uh, role in this film. So we would see the characters together with a very sharp and huge Hogwarts in the background, or the really dramatic landscape of Scotland. It was decided that we would go to Scotland in May, because it's the month when. The sun shines, they haven't had rain for the last 3,000 years, and it rained every day for 28 days. And literally the set would you know, be washing out from under us, and at lunch we'd have to have helicopter dropping gravel and have the, the crew put gravel back in underneath to keep the dirt from washing out from the set, and we'd bring everybody back up and try and work. I was concerned, you know, about, you know, what does this do to the look? Although Alfonso and Michael literally said that, you know, they felt like it was the best look we could have actually come up with for the movie. 
It was phenomenal. We had this soft grey overcast Scottish light, which dramatically for the story is brilliant. No, it was a nightmare getting it, but worth it. Yeah, this is a cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> The universe of Harry Potter is a universe that was very eloquent. So it was, I, I felt very comfortable to play in that universe. <laughs> Each day is an, an adventure, and you never tire of it. It's a great world to be a part of. <laughs> ah! Ah!